Now, if you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10 as we continue our journey through the Bible, John chapter 10, and the title of this message is The Ultimate Security, The Ultimate Security. This passage is also known as the Blessed Assurance because it's going to deal with the believer's uh, security. And uh, we'll pick it up from verse 22 and we'll read to verse 30, but we'll finish the whole chapter in our study. Verse 22, now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. If Jesus, and Jesus answered and said, I told you, and you do not believe, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you're not my sheep, as I say to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we... Read as we study your word today that we would hear your voice, that we would see the things in this passage that draws us closer to you. We pray for understanding and clarity of heart and and mind. Those who have things that are going on in their life right now, that they would be able to lay it at the foot of the cross, that they can have peace and comfort right now. So we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. As we're coming to the end of this chapter, we have already seen how Jesus is the true shepherd and how He is the good shepherd and how He knows His sheep and He cares for His sheep and He ultimately lays His life down for His sheep. And for that reason, as we saw the previous week, that there is this division amongst them. And uh, some said that He has a demon and uh, He claims to be God, and they had problems with that. How can a man claim to be the good shepherd? And that was a reference to uh, God. And uh, others said that he, uh, these are not the words of a demon. How can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And that is only a work that God can do. And so as we come now to verse 22, uh, there's a three-month gap between verse 21 and 22. Uh, Three months have passed since Jesus stood before the religious leaders and the people of Israel and presented himself as the good shepherd. So how do we know three months have passed? Well, the first part of chapter 10 continues on from what was taking place from actually 7 through part of 10. Um, And that was uh, dealing with the Feast of the Tabernacles, uh, which took place in early October time. And uh, now John tells us that this is the Feast of Dedication or what we'd call Hanukkah, which is celebrated in the latter part of December. So three months have passed, giving the Jews a little more time to think about His teaching that He gave them. And now you have to understand that the religious leaders of the day were not thrilled to see Jesus back in the temple, as verse 23 mentions, uh, around the time of the Feast of Dedication, and here's why. The Feast of Dedication celebrated uh, the overthrow of the Syrian occupation in Israel in uh, 165 B.C., and particularly the overthrow of a man named Antioch Epiphanes, uh, who was Syria's king. And some of you are familiar with the story. Antioch, he was the one that went into the temple uh, in Jerusalem and slaughtered everything there, the priests, the attendants. He tore down the Holy of Holies, built an altar to his own God, and uh, there sacrificed pigs in, in, in total defiance of the God of Israel and, and desecrating the temple. And during this time in his rule in Jerusalem, the Old Testament Scriptures, it was banned, and any worship of Jehovah was out of the question, and uh, it was a horrible time for the nation of Israel. And then came along a man named Judas Maccabeus and his sons, and they led as what is called the Maccabean Revolt um, and uh, resulted the overthrow of this uh, period of time, the Assyrians and retaking of the temple. And after the temple was fully restored and the dedication uh, to the Lord, uh, they had a feast, and it's the Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah, and that's still celebrated today. 
And this is the reason that the Jews loved the feast, and uh, is that it reminded them that the day, there's going to be a day coming that the Messiah would come and once and for all free them from their oppressors and establish uh, as God's people in the land. And so, in many ways, the Jewish vision of the Messiah is still uh, taken from this event. Uh, a charismatic leader would uh, defeat their enemies and establish them as God's people. And so, that's what they're looking for, and they're still looking for a Messiah today, yet he's already been here. His name's Jesus. So, you can see why the Jewish leaders were really uptight when Jesus came back into the temple and beginning at this time of the feast. And as you can see, they asked him a particular question, as you notice, verse 24. It says, how long will you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, if you are the Messiah, tell us clearly. So you see how that fits into the context here at the feast. It was the right question uh, at the right time, but it had the wrong motive behind it. And here's how we know that. Because halfway through this discussion, as we saw, that Jesus makes the statement that I and my Father are one. And when he does, what's, what's going to take place, as you'll see in the next couple verses, is that the Jewish leadership end up taking rocks to stone him. And we know this, uh, that uh, there wasn't a bunch of extra rocks uh, lying around at the temple, so they probably were carrying them. So it's like they have their wallet, they have their phone, and they have some rocks for good occasions. And so these rocks were prepared from the beginning to throw for a time like this. They were just looking for the right timing, the right answer uh, that would allow them to use it. And still, Jesus was, uh, his answer was very open and revealing. Notice what he says in verse 25 and 26. Jesus answered them, says, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you do not believe me because you're not my sheep, as I say to you. So what Jesus is saying here is that there's a problem, there's no problem with his straightforwardness. It was their inability to believe, that was the problem. Jesus says, I've already told you my mission, my calling, uh, in every conceivable way I can. And if you have been with us for some time as we've been going through this, you, you, you've seen his statements, you've, you understand this is exactly what he's been declaring. But then Jesus adds this, and this is so important. He says, not only did I tell you plainly that I was the Messiah, but the works that I did in my Father's name, it backs up my claim. So as we pointed out before, Jesus was all talk and he was all action. So not only did he claim to be the Messiah of Israel, but he also did these things that only the Messiah could do. In fact, John the Baptist, his followers, came to Jesus and asked him the same question. Back in Matthew chapter 11, verse 5, Jesus says, Go and tell John, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And so Jesus, he talked to them, but more importantly, he walked it out. He walked the walk. Not only did he speak the truth, but he also lived it out. He did the works that the Messiah was to do. So the problem was not the message or the evidence that backed up the message. It was the problem of their unbelief. And as we see this all the time, when you talk to people about Jesus, and they'll say, well, I'm a logical person. You know, I need the facts, this faith sort of stuff, it scares me. And so you can tell them about the history and authenticity of the Bible. You can tell them that the Biblical account is the most accurate account than any other historical document out there. You can tell them about fulfilled prophecy and the statistical probability of those prophecies to happening. You can show them that the Bible talks about the last days, how the focus of the world is going to be on Israel. And it's going to be a cup of trembling to every nation. You can tell them about the historical documentation, about the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, far greater and far more manuscript evidence to prove the Bible than any other historical document out there. You know, compared to Homer Odyssey, which only has the 643 manuscripts, where the Bible has over 24,000 manuscripts that we can rely on. You can read the book of Proverbs, the Ten Commandments, the Sermon on the Mount, 1 Corinthians 13, and you ask them, what, what part of those are outdated? What part of those are irrelevant that don't connect with the real world? And, they'll, and, and what you'll find is it's not the lack of facts that stand in their way. It's their unbelief. 
They, their, their minds are already made up. Don't confuse them with the facts. And that's exactly the way it was with these Jewish leaders. So when Jesus says in verse 30, I and my Father are one, notice the next couple of verses, they, they took up stones to stone him. And I love the response of Jesus uh, to all this. He says in verse 32, he says, Many works have I shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? And this is so good. Are you going to stone me, really, for uh, stone me to death for healing a lame man or giving sight to a man that was born blind? Are, are you going to stone me for rising up, you know, raising Jairus' daughter from the dead or casting demons from a demon-possessed man? Maybe it was for the healing of the leper, you know, taking his rotting flesh and making it white as snow. Maybe it was for the feeding of the 5,000 or calming the storms at the sea. And I'm sure that when Jesus said this, that all these sort of miracles was, was flowing through their thoughts and their minds. And so they said, notice verse 33, For a good work we don't stone you, but for what? Blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself to be God. So if you write in your Bible and you highlight it, circle it, you know, here's a verse that you can mark. When people who come knocking on your door, asking those questions, well, Jesus Christ is not God, or they say, well, he never claimed to be God, well, you can take him right here. When Jesus says, I and my Father are one, he's claiming to be God. And we see that the Jews understand exactly what he was saying. And uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding with, uh, with this particular verse that uh, Jesus is saying. Uh, a lot of people have difficulty when, when, Jesus, when the Father speaks to Jesus at his baptism and says, oh, this is my beloved Son. Or even when Jesus uh, is praying in John 17, he is praying to the Father. So a lot of people have a problem with this. But here's the thing. Jesus is not claiming to be the same person as the Father. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three distinct persons. He's claiming to be of the same essence of the Father. He's claiming to be God. Now, the deity of Christ is so important. You can't get around it. And, and it's so clear throughout Scripture. Here's a couple things that you're going to see. Let me give you a couple examples. The Old Testament speaks of Jesus' deity. A well-known prophecy of the coming Messiah in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. We usually see this and read this, especially at Christmas time. But it says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So he shall be called Mighty God. That's one of the titles of Jesus. Secondly, he called himself God. We've already seen this a couple times in our study, but for example, in uh, John chapter 8, verse 58, when Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So he's claiming to be the, the Almighty God, the I am that spoke to Moses. Thirdly, we see that the Jews understand what he meant. You see that time and again. When Jesus claimed to be doing the works of the Father, in John chapter 5, verse 18, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. And we see that the same thing in this passage here in verse 33. And if you pay attention to what's happening, you'll notice that Jesus didn't try to correct the Jews. He didn't try to correct anyone that tried to worship him. He doesn't respond and say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, here's what I meant. You never see that. Fourthly, you see the apostles call him uh, God to his face. When uh, Thomas saw him for the first time after his resurrection, in John 20, 28, Thomas answered and says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus doesn't stop or correct Thomas there. Uh, fifthly, he received worship from men. In the Ten Commandments, you know that God told the people not to worship other gods or bow before them in Exodus 20. Even in the book of Revelation, we see an example of how this works. When John was so overwhelmed by the things that he had seen, he falls down to worship the angel uh, that he's seen uh, showing all these things. And in Revelation 22, 9, he says, See that you don't do that. I am your fellow servant. And uh, your, your brethren, uh, the, the uh, prophets, and those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And Jesus, when he walked on water, and Matthew records this in Matthew 14, 33, those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. 
And all throughout the Gospels, you see all sorts of people giving Jesus worship. Uh, Jesus knew the Scriptures, and yet he allowed others to worship him. In fact, even in, uh, as we saw a couple weeks ago in John chapter 9, verse 38, where it, the, the man who was born blind, he worships Jesus. So over and over, you see Jesus is worshipped. The apostles uh, wrote that Jesus is God. We've already studied in, back in the chapter 1 of John uh, very clearly from the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you know in verse 14 it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's talking about Jesus. Paul, writing to the Romans, uh, writing about the Jews when he wrote in chapter 9, verse 5, he says, to whom the fathers are speaking, the, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, whom according to the flesh Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. So over and over you see how Jesus is God. Uh, even God calls Jesus God. Uh, the author of Hebrews starts off his letter by talking about Jesus and how he's better than everyone, including the angels. And the author was careful to quote God himself on these verses. In chapter 1, verse 7, says the angels, he says, to whom makes his angels spirits and ministers of flames of fire. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. So God the Father is calling the Son God, and he says that his throne will be forever. So why is it important to believe that Jesus is God? Can I just believe in Jesus without believing that he is God? No, for two main reasons. Number one, that's another Jesus. If he's not God, it's another Jesus. Paul rebuked the Corinthians for putting up with all kinds of strange doctrines. In chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, verse 3, it says, I fear somehow that a serpent, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so that your minds may be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. If he who comes and preaches another Jesus in whom we have preached, or if uh, you have received a different spirit in whom you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may put up with it. And he also warns the uh, Galatians about a different gospel out there. So there is more than one Jesus that's out there, but it's not the Jesus of the Bible. It's important not just to say that you follow Jesus, but the true Jesus of the Bible, that he is God. The Mormons have a different Jesus, and we love our Mormon friends. But it's important to understand that the Jesus of their church, uh, in their church that they talk about, is not the Jesus of the Bible. In fact, if you understand Mormon doctrine, uh, in fact, there's a book called Mormon Doctrine on page 129, it says Jesus was first uh, spirit born in heaven. But the Bible teaches that uh, Jesus has always existed with the Father. He is not a created being. Secondly, they also say on page 163 that Jesus and Lucifer are spirit brothers and that uh, we're, we're born as siblings in heaven to both of them. And both of them had a different plan and Jesus' plan was the one that God the Father accepted. So that's a different Jesus. Jesus of the Bible is not the spirit brother of Lucifer. The Bible teaches that Jesus is God, not a created being. And the Bible teaches that Satan is a fallen angel, a created being. The Jehovah Witness have a different Jesus than the, than the uh, Jesus of the Bible. They don't teach what the Bible teaches, yet they have their New World translations, and they uh, chop and change what they want it to say. But the Watchtower and Bible Tract Society um, says this, that there's only one God, uh, one person whom we call the Father, and they call Jehovah. Uh, the first creation was being named Michael the Archangel. And when it was time for the Messiah to be born, Michael became a human flesh naming Jesus. So they believe Jesus is Michael the Archangel. So uh, as you see these examples, this is exactly what Paul was referring to, another Jesus. And that's just starting out. There's another Jesus out there. The second reason why it's important to have the correct Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, is because of the payment of your sin depends upon it. Your eternal destiny depends on how you choose to deal with your sin. Whether you agree or not, the Bible says that we're all sinners. We have all fallen short of the, the glory of God. The Bible says that one day we'll all appear before the judgment seat uh, for the payment over our sin. But again, there is that exchange that took place. 
Those who are born again, Jesus took your sin. It is appointed for men to die once, and after this is judgment, as it says in Hebrews 9.27. So when judgment comes, the penalty of sin is death, eternal separation from God. So God doesn't want you to have to pay for your sin by sending you to hell. God has done something to pay for our sins. And from the earliest times, the Bible records that God's setting up a system uh, for which a sacrifice was to be made by someone or something else that could pay for your sins. And that's exactly what Jesus did, as the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, that exchange that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of him. So if Jesus was just an ordinary man and he was somehow to die as a sacrifice, he would only be able to pay for the sins of a single person. But because Jesus was God in human flesh, he was able to lay his life down, the eternal, infinite life. He was able to pay for the sins of the whole world. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So the Jews got it exactly, and, and they knew exactly what Jesus was saying here when he claimed to be God. They knew that Jesus, who was in their eyes a just man, making himself out to be God, and not just making a vague reference of being God, but clear declaration. You can't deny it. They heard him say, I and my father are one. They heard him say, I, uh, before Abraham was, I am. The disciples would hear Jesus say, if you've seen me, you have seen the father. It's pretty clear. You can't dance around it. But I also have to tell you that the Jewish audience, it was even more clear than it does for us. So clear that they used it for grounds to stone him and to try to kill him on the spot. Now, to counteract this, Jesus makes a statement to knock them back on their heels. Uh, listen very carefully to the statement that he makes that causes a lot of confusion. It still causes confusion today. Notice verse 34. Jesus answered them and says, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scriptures cannot be broken, do you say of him the Father sanctified and sent the world, you are blasphemed because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe, believe the works that you may be know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Now, this is kind of a, a difficult section, but let me give you uh, the bottom line here. What Jesus is telling these Jewish leaders is that the one thing that they should have been looking for is the Messiah is deity is that he was deity and he has deity. They should have been looking for a man who not only claimed to be God, but also did the works of God. Let me explain. This verse that you see here was a quote from uh, Psalm 82, which starts out in verse 1. It says, uh, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? So the reference here is to the judges of Israel. Uh, the Supreme Court, if you will, of that day, who God appointed to carry out justice in His behalf. And they were to speak as His representatives on earth. And so He refers to them as their God, uh, as gods. And uh, as you can see, they, they weren't doing their job. In fact, they were abusing their positions. And so it goes on to say in verse 6 of uh, Psalm 82, and He says, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like any prince. And so the point that Jesus is making here is that if God can call these earthly judges who had misrepresented Him as gods, then how much more could Jesus, the one in whom the Father had sanctified and sent into the world, called to be the Son of God, and these Jews should, uh, it, they, they understood exactly what He was talking about. They shouldn't have been stumbled by the fact that he claimed to be deity. They should have been looking for it. And again, Jesus' appear, uh, appeal is to do the works uh, and his miracles say. You know, so if you notice what he said, so if, if, if I don't do the miracles that are consistent with my claim to be deity, then don't believe me. But if I'm doing the miracles that reflect deity, then believe me for the miracle's sake. So, and this is kind of like the last straw that just sent them over the edge. 
And as you see in verse 39, that they sought to seize him, and, but he escaped out of their hands. And so uh, they were not able to get his hands on him until his hour had come. So was, as we know, his hour had not come. His life was in the hands of the Father. So what should we learn from this particular encounter? Well, first and foremost, the reason that most people don't believe in Jesus is not because of, you know, th- th- there's not enough facts, but because their hearts have been hardened through unbelief. You have heard it said that those who, you know, you know, when you talk to some people about, you know, becoming a Christian, you know, if you can talk them to becoming a Christian, then, then the devil can talk them out of it. And that's so true. You can't argue people into the, he- in, into the kingdom. You're not going to see someone up there in heaven and say, well, how did you get here? Oh, I lost an argument, you know. It's not going to happen. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be consistent in uh, presenting the facts to people. Even the apostle Peter talks about in 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give a defense for the you know, hope that is in you. And, and we should be able to make a sound defense because we can prove everything. We can back it up. And that's what being equipped is all about. But we also realize that salvation is a supernatural thing. Those who come to Christ have been called by the Father. Salvation is a supernatural work of God in a person's life. Our testimony, uh, he uses our our defense of the gospel, uh, but ultimately, no one comes to Christ unless the Father draws them, okay? The second thing that we learn from this passage is that miracles do not guarantee a conversion. And you hear people all the time saying, oh, if I could just see a miracle... I would believe. And others would say, well, if there's more miracles in the church, there would be revival in the land. But that's not true because time and again, these religious leaders saw miracle after miracle. And how often did Jesus send those whom he healed back into the synagogue, back into the temple to offer the appropriate sacrifice in response to the work of God that he had done in their lives? So he did it all the time. And so the religious leaders saw tons of miracles face to face, but it didn't move them to believe. And so it's not the lack of evidence or the lack of the miraculous that keeps people from Jesus. It's the hardness of the heart that is a result of their unbelief. And that is why God says today is the day of salvation. So every time you put off salvation, every time you you say, no, not today, you're getting your heart harder and harder until finally God gives you over to that unbelief. And friends, that is a place that you don't want to be. The testimony of hell is not only people got what they deserve, but also what they wanted. They don't want anything to do with God, and that's exactly what they're going to get for all eternity. Unfortunately for us, there's another side to this. Back up to verse 26. It says, But do you not believe because you're not my sheep? As I say to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, And they follow me. So in this section, in verse 27 through 30, Jesus lays out the security of the believer. He lays out the security that is ours in Christ. And make no mistake, if you're a believer here today, that you have security in Christ that is beyond anything that you could ever imagine. And here's where it begins. It begins with the marks of a true sheep. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. So that's a good description of what a Christian is. It's right here. A Christian is one who listens for and hears the voice of Jesus. They are known by Him. In other words, they live in relationship with Him, and they follow Him. A Christian is one who hears the voice of Jesus and then does what Jesus tells them to do. And that's what the Spirit-filled life is all about. Now, we're not talking about perfection here. We're talking about a consistent effort here. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. It's the sanctification, the development, and the process that he takes us through. Jesus says, you will know his sheep by their fruit in their lives. And here's part of the fruit. They're going to hear the voice of the Lord, and they're going to do what he tells them to do. So there's obedience there. That's part of the, 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 the fruit that comes out of that. You're going to serve, you're going to love, you're going to worship, you're going to give, you're going to witness. These are all natural results if you're hearing the shepherd's voice and the voice of Jesus. And when that's the case, when that's the reality of a person's life, then here's what it it does. Verse 28, 
Jesus says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. So notice, Jesus says, I give them eternal life, making himself equal with God, because he has authority over eternal salvation exclusively is in Jesus' hands. And, he's, and Jesus says, I give them eternal life. So it's not earned by good behavior. It's not earned by deeds. It's not earned by going to church or anything like that. He gives it to us. And Jesus says, they shall never be perished. They shall never, meaning it's not going to happen because we're secure in Jesus Christ. If you are born again, how do you become unborn then? You can't. Notice that Jesus says, no one can snatch them, that's us, out of my hand. So can anyone take our salvation out of the hands of Jesus? And the answer is no. Now, within this verse, there's also a three-step progression here, if you notice. Jesus, he gives his sheep uh, eternal life, which guaran- and then he guarantees that they shall never perish, and now sh- neither shall anyone snatch them out of his hand. The security of the believer starts with Jesus, and it's de- been deposited into us, uh, and that's eternal life. And as we uh, told you many times before, eternal life is not just the, the quantity of life, you know, the, the length of life, but it's also the quality of life, the life that God gives us that flows into us. Without eternal life, you will perish, period. But with eternal life, you experience the joy and experience the eternal realm and the fellowship with God. Eternal life that is in you links you in relationship with God. And I believe this is what Jesus was getting at at the illustration of the vine and the branches in John 15. For the branch to survive, it has to be connected with the vine because life flows out of the vine into the branches. And the same way eternal life flows out of Jesus into us, there is this constant exchange that takes place. So he's giving us eternal life. It is a one-time deal, but it is an ongoing relationship. And here's the guarantee, that life is in you, you will never perish. Death will never have a hold over you. Hell will have no overclaim over you. You are a child of God, equipped for eternity. And that's an incredible thing for us to grasp onto. But it gets better because the third phrase that it tells us here, that nothing can take that away from you. Jesus says, neither shall anyone snatch you out of my hand. So in the context here, there's no thief, no wolf, no bandit, no uh, hireling, no demon. Uh, Not even the devil can pluck you out of the shepherd's hand. Uh, The Bible says in Colossians 3.3, For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So friends, if you're looking for some good news this morning, here it is. If you belong to Jesus, if he has placed his life in you, then you are absolutely secure in a relationship and no one can snatch you out of his hands. In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers or things present or things to come, nor height nor debt nor any created thing shall be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a pretty complete list, amen? There's nothing in life or death. There's no earthly or spiritual powers. There's nothing in heaven or hell that can separate you from the love of God in Christ. Your salvation, your future uh, is absolutely secure in Him. Now, some are thinking, hey, I'm not into this eternal security bit. Well, that's too bad because Jesus is. These are His ideas. Jesus says to the one who has received eternal life shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of his hands. To put it another way, Jesus is saying to those whom the Father has given to him is going to be kept by him, period. That work that Jesus begins, he will finish. That's good news. Many years ago, and more than many years ago, in 1933 through 1937, when, when the Golden Gate Bridge was being built, There's a lot of workers that fell to their death. And so the city erected these huge nets beneath the the bridge. And after that was in place, only a handful actually did fall. uh, But they were safe, and the work was completed in record time with record safety. Why? Because the workers can concentrate on their jobs and not having to worry about dying. A productive Christian, to be that, 
You need to know that your future is absolutely secure. You need to be able to focus on the task at hand instead of always worrying about your future. So if you have the security that is in Christ, you don't have to worry about it. Our time is in His hands. Imagine a child who doesn't know from day to day whether he is a member of a family. One day if he's good, he's in. If he's bad, he's out. Or if a father you know, loved him one day, but he didn't the next day. That child is going to be messed up, right? Emotional, mental, psychological mess. So this is one of those blessed passages that we have the assurance. Now, it gets even better because not only does Jesus commit uh, to, to keeping you eternally secure, but the Father as well. Notice verse 29. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So you get the picture here that Jesus is holding you in his hand, pretty secure. But then the Father comes along and puts his hand over Jesus' hand. So there's no one greater than God. And if someone is able to snatch you out of God's hands, then they'd have to be greater than God, and which we know is not true. That's not going to happen. You see, that's your security. It begins with eternal life being infused into you by Jesus Christ himself, a life that guarantees you that you'll never perish. But then Jesus says he holds you in his hand, and no one is able to snatch you out of that. And then your security takes another step further as the Father has his hand over that. In fact, as you see how secure you are, that the span of the whole universe is in the palm of his hands. You, know, you think you can jump out of his hands or someone can pluck you out, you have a better chance of jumping to the moon than that ever happening. We know that's not going to happen. And, and if the Father has you in, your ha- in His hand, you're pretty secure. Amen. Amen. Now, what about those, and this brings up a whole different discussion, which we're not going to get too far into, but uh, what about those who've made a profession of faith? They're on fire, but then they fell away. And not only did they fall away, but they end up rejecting God. That's a tough question. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out of us that it might be made manifest that they were not of us. Pretty clear. There's a lot of people going to church, they get excited about Christianity, about church religion, and, and, and never really make a commitment to listen to Jesus and to follow Him. It's all surface. There's no real relationship. And so as soon as the church doesn't deliver what they want, they hit the road looking for something else. And you're going to see a great falling away happen because they're not true believers. They're going to be deceived. Now, it doesn't mean that people don't stumble and fall or backslide because people backslide all the time. But here's what you do see happening. When they do, and they go back to the mire, but like the prodigal, They can't stay there for long. Something draws them back to the Father. And that's what keeps us going back is the Spirit of God that lives inside of them. God won't let them go. A true believer can fall into sin, but they can't stay there long. And that's one of the most miserable things to be uh, as a Christian living in the world because you can't be content. You're always, something's not right with you. Something says, I know I shouldn't be doing this. That's God speaking to you. Stop it. A dog can go back to the vomit. A pig can go to its pig pen. But a sheep won't be able to stand either. They'll have to return to the shepherd of their souls. And so Jesus was able to say that the Father and His high priestly prayer, Father, you know, all that is given to me I've kept and I lost none. That's going to be His report. So if you're a follower, a true follower of Christ, if you hear His voice and you do what He calls you to do, then you are pretty secure. He knows you. You have eternal life, and and that's guaranteed. Now, to continue in the final verses of this chapter, he says, they sought to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. And it's kind of interesting because you've seen this quite a few times, haven't you? You know, and every time he slips out of their midst, it kind of makes you a little worried about this guy. It tells us plainly that the Jews surrounded him for this very purpose. They didn't want him to escape. Now, this isn't some Jackie Chan or Bruce Lee deal. Jesus hacked and leaped through and karate his way through them. 
No, he slipped out of their midst. One minute he's there, one minute he's gone. We can't explain it, but we know his time was not yet. God protected him. He was able to escape. And then notice verse 40. He went away beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. And there many came to him and says, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true. And many believed in him there. So notice where Jesus goes. He leaves Jerusalem and goes up beyond the Jordan, where John used to baptize and where Herod, uh, you know, put, uh, you know, where he's put to death by Herod. Now, you have to understand, this place was a rough place. It was barren. It was desolate. It was harsh. This isn't a place that you go for a week and get away. So, so Jesus was out there in the wilderness, beyond the Jordan, and it tells us that many came to him. And what this tells us is that there's always going to be a remnant of people who will follow Jesus. There will always be a group of people who will hear the message of Jesus and will be moved by it. In fact, I believe there's even some that may be here today or those that are listening online. And the Spirit of God is moving in their hearts and who will hear the message of Jesus. And they will say, hey, this is true. This is right. I need this in my life. And they will follow Jesus today. And so Jesus goes beyond the Jordan here. And there's a crowd of people that follow him here. And it was during one of those up close and personal times that they came to Jesus. And they said, John did no signs, no miracles, but the things that he spoke about you, the things that he spoke about Jesus were true. Now, this is what effective ministry is all about. It's all about telling people the truth about Jesus, period. It, it, it takes the thing that the, this is what makes the kingdom of God move forward by telling people about Jesus, and here's what's so good about this. Every single one of us could do this. Just telling people about Jesus, connecting people to Jesus. Effective ministry is not a result of doing great things for God. It's the result of doing the little things for God with a great motive. God asked John the Baptist to do one thing, to tell the nation of Israel about the Messiah, and that's exactly what John did. And the result was what? a great ministry, an effective ministry that Jesus was able to build on. Most great moves of God are a, a result of a bunch of little things done by faithful people with the right heart and the right attitude. Effective ministry happens because people who are faithful to do little things that sets the stage for the big things. And that's why a lot of people never accomplish anything for God. They want to go straight to the big things and bypass the little things. It's like if they can't do something great, they're not going to do anything at all. So nothing happens. And you get these people who have these great ideas and plans for ministry and great ideas of what they want to accomplish for God. And you ask them, well, what are you doing right now to lay the groundwork for those things? They say nothing because they're waiting for the big thing to happen. They're waiting for position. They're waiting for opportunity. But I have to tell you, that's not how the kingdom of God works. Jesus says to his disciples in Mark chapter 9, he says, if anyone desires to be first, he needs to be last. He also goes on to say in Matthew 23, 11, but he who is great among you must be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So if we're going to have a great impact, if we're going to have a, you know, a, a great effect in this world for the kingdom, and... and uh, Great in, in defining great this way, to be useful, to be effective, to be powerful for the kingdom, then we need to be servants first and foremost. The foundation of ministry is servanthood. Be faithful in the little things. He has called you, each and every one of us, in our own unique ways to tell people about Jesus, to live out that example. And if we just keep telling people about Jesus, about his awesome love, about his cleansing blood, about his powerful life that flows from the, his resurrection, about his wonderful plan of salvation that transforms us from the inside out, about his amazing grace that gives us access to all these things, the, and, and sometimes even signs and wonders happen through this. But God will do things in our midst that will just blow our minds. But the centerpiece to everything is about Jesus Christ, about his death, him dying for us, how he was raised, and how he is coming back. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time.
to gather together to learn your word. We pray that you continue to lead us and guide us and direct us and fill us with your spirit and to place those people in our life that we can tell about you. I pray that you would continue to give us the courage and the boldness to make those steps and to have those conversations or to talk to people about your amazing love, about the gospel. We thank you for dying on the cross for us. Thank you for being the substitute for us and that exchange where we have the righteousness uh, in Christ. So we thank you for your word. We thank you for your plan for each and every one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.